Okay, good morning, everyone. I feel like normally when we have this event, there's some like catastrophic like weather event, like one year it was flooding and Dahlia Lithwick was like stuck on the freeway and uh, another year there was the fire on the metro. So I feel like the gods are smiling upon us uh, this morning. So welcome to the Constitutional Accountability Center's sixth annual home stretch at the Supreme Court. My name is Elizabeth Wydra, and as CAC's president, I am thrilled to welcome you here, either here in person, on the panel, or joining us on the live stream. It's great to see so many familiar faces on the panel and the audience, um, and we're really excited for those of you engaging with us on social media to use the hashtag CAC Home Stretch to follow this great conversation this morning. I also want to thank, of course, the National Press Club for hosting this important discussion and to the staff here who always are absolutely excellent and make sure that everything runs smoothly. And of course, a huge thank you to the team at CAC uh, who always do just a stellar job. Uh, and it's always a great event thanks to their hard work year after year. So this event is successful, I think. Uh, I'm a little biased, of course. But um, <laughs> because of where it falls in the calendar, we like to take stock the day after oral arguments conclude as the Supreme Court enters its home stretch leading up to the end of June to look at what themes have emerged, what big cases have been decided, and what big cases are yet to come. This year, with issues such as incorporating a provision of the Eighth Amendment against the states already decided, and of course, rulings expected in June on uh, the census, as well as constitutionality of partisan gerrymandering, I anticipate another fascinating discussion this morning, and I'm so thrilled that you can all be a part of it. But before I turn the stage over to this outstanding panel, I wanted to speak to you briefly about the place in the, the place that the court holds in this particularly fraught moment. We gather at a particularly momentous time. From the current occupant of the White House, we witness threats to the rule of law, the stability of our constitutional democracy, even the practice of common decency toward our fellow human beings. And we see these threats on a near daily basis. Placing children in cages, blocking people from entering the country because of their race or religion, barring transgender people from serving in the military, attacking the courts and impartial, fair law enforcement, rigging the process by which the Constitution demands that all persons in America be counted, and through which votes and government resources are apportioned and allocated. And all of that is, of course, in addition to whatever obstruction of justice and flirting with foreign influence that was described in the Mueller report. These threats cannot be set aside or, or ignored, at least not without the American people paying a dear price. The strength of our nation and the institutions built to serve us instead must confront these challenges, resolve them in favor of the rule of law, and reinforce the bedrock values of our amended Constitution equality, inclusion, and fairness. Alexander Hamilton wrote that the majesty of the national authority must be manifested through the medium of the courts of justice. Aside from the cherry blossoms earlier this month, there is unfortunately precious little majesty here in Washington these days. While it's true that the Supreme Court is rated higher in terms of favorability than the president or Congress, that is a very low bar. And the American people deserve better. The founders set that bar higher, and we have believed for decades that the Supreme Court could easily clear that bar, but not anymore. Try as he might, and some might question whether he has been trying hard enough lately, Chief Justice Roberts is in danger of losing his battle to keep the court that he leads divorced from politics. In fact, actions of the Trump administration have made John Roberts' position more decisive than at any time in his nearly 15 years on the court. President Trump, it seems, views the Roberts court as his potential, perhaps literal, get out of jail free card, saying just yesterday that if he were impeached by Congress, as is prescribed by the Constitution, he would look to the Roberts court to bail him out. Now, while the president continues to not know how the Constitution works, unfortunately, Trump is not necessarily wrong for looking to the Roberts Court for relief. 
It has been the place where some of his most outrageous policy actions have been resurrected. At the end of last term, of course, a majority of justices showed themselves willing to pretend that his Muslim travel and refugee ban was not based on Muslim animus, despite the president's many comments indicating so. And now this term, it looks possible that a majority of the conservative justices will again be willing to pretend that the administration's attempt to rig the census by adding a citizenship question are anything other than an attempt to discourage and intimidate immigrants and people of color. Now, we have um, someone who cares deeply about the institutions of government, Chief Justice John Roberts. I get it. I care about them too. I can get why he wants to believe that this administration is not flagrantly violating basic rules of law, basic fundamentals of our constitutional democracy, and that this administration is not willing to lie to the public, to the courts, to Congress. But how gullible do they expect us to believe they are? We know the justices are pretty smart. And while they may work on hallowed legal ground, we know that they live in the real world just like the rest of us. So the question is, what will Chief Justice John Roberts do? How will they react to Trump's repeated suggestions that he's got the Roberts court in his back pocket? We need more than ever the necessary independence of the judicial character, as Hamilton put it. So now at this historic crossroads, Chief Justice John Roberts' choice is straightforward. He can turn to the right, ignoring the higher percentages of Americans who now see the court as too conservative, and plow ahead with the Republican legal project, giving Trump the rubber stamp he seems to expect in the Supreme Court. Or Roberts can look straight ahead, remembering his caution that when the court has erred, and it has erred greatly, it has done so because of political pressure. By heeding his own caution, which points toward the Constitution's text, history, and values, Roberts can steer the court away from a conservative extreme agenda and back toward the middle road. Now certainly none but a few observers would uh, think that Roberts is anything close to a moderate, much less a liberal, but as battles over our democracy and its very character reach the court, many that focus on President Trump and his administration, the choice between exalting the rule of law and indulging conservative ideology and a lawless president should be a clear one. And now on that cheery note, I'm going to turn it over to Ari Melber, who uh, has been cheerily killing it on MSNBC lately, uh, who will introduce our amazing panel and start this fascinating discussion. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thanks to Elizabeth for, uh, for that hearty introduction and for the work that you do, which is, is important and substantive. Um, I thought I would begin with the folks in the room uh, with a couple basic questions by a show of hands. And as always, you have the right to opt out and not participate at all. Um, but by a show of hands, I'm curious, how many people have no opinion, no feelings about the current administration, are, are neutral? And by a show of hands, how many people have some opinion or feeling about the current administration? And some people are not participating. Maybe they're <laughs> careful journalists. Uh, and how many, by a show of hands, would say that the administration in its first two years here has been impactful, has had a significant impact uh, on our nation? And how many, by a show of hands, would say no? Interesting. Uh, because I think that you can make an argument as you look at this administration um, that for all the sound and fury and noise, um, which certainly is a choice of presidential leadership that may substitute for other actions and other governance, um, it has not done a lot of big, enduring actions uh, in its first two years, particularly as compared to other times when you had united government, when, when you had one party control um, both political branches. Uh, I certainly think on, on legislation and policy, you basically have one big domestic bill in the tax plan and not much else. Um, and in foreign policy, a president who has been noticed for all of his disruption and all of his experimentation, uh, you could argue has not done a ton to change US foreign policy, certainly not as much as George W. Bush, who made radical changes, whether people agree with him or not, or as Barack Obama, who pushed back against a lot of those changes. 
I think what I'm ramping up to is of interest to the, hopefully this room is the area of, of some of the most significant and enduring change is, is on the Supreme Court. And in, interestingly, there's an argument certainly uh, from mainstream conservative scholars and, and Federalist Society that in that area, Donald Trump has acted most like any other traditional Republican president would have been expected to act. For all the untraditional appointments that have been made and vacancies that have been left and what is sometimes called the sort of Fox News green room staffing of key posts in the government, when it came to picking these two Supreme Court nominees, uh, everyone knows they were right off the Federalist Society list. They were the type of names that might have come from a Jeb Bush or a Rubio presidency. And so we're gathered here looking at a court that's already shifted quite a bit, um, but shifted, I don't think, towards an experiment in Trumpism so much as a hardening of the type of, of conservative legal scholars and, and legal judges um, that were desired. And so as we look at that, I think it's important, especially here where we're in substance and we're not going to just run around and chase headlines, to think through what does it mean in a time of Trumpism where the conversation is dominated by Trumpism, and I would argue strong feelings on both sides, except for this gentleman in front who didn't raise his hand, so he may have no feelings. He may be the Zen Buddhist here in the Beltway. Um, but, uh, but all kidding aside, with all those strong feelings and all of that Trumpism, um, we're greeted with a court here in this term and in these last two years that is simply plodding along towards what I think the conservative legal establishment wanted and has gotten in judges. And what does that mean and what does that look like? Particularly with some cases that, uh, as we're going to discuss, range from immigration, double jeopardy, racial sensitivity issues, as well as arbitration, business, and, and other things that, again, might, might not be on even the radar of this, of this president. I don't know that he even knows some of the rulings that some of his uh, picks are making. So with that as a, as a thought to get us going and to keep an open mind, um, let me bring in the entire panel. Uh, Kristen Clark is the leader of the National Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. Uh, and does a lot of work on racial justice issues throughout the country. Uh, William Jay is a partner at Goodwin and previously worked for the Solicitor General and has argued I count 17 Supreme Court cases. Pretty cool. Uh, Allison Riggs leads the voting rights section at the Southern Coalition for Social Justice. Uh, and Brianne Garode is the Constitutional Accountability Center's chief counsel. And as you can imagine, there's a lot of other accolades I could list off. But what I'd rather do uh, is let our panelists prove themselves to you with their insights. Uh, a few minutes from everyone, a free-for-all on the current court and what the two new justices mean, uh, and then we're going to walk through some cases. Good morning. Um, thanks so much to Elizabeth and the team at CAC for bringing us here uh, together. I'm going to start off talking about the blockbuster case from this term, the census case that was heard by the court this past Tuesday. Um, I'm only going to interject to say, because you know, I work in television now, so I always follow the rundown. They want you guys to talk a little bit about the two new justices, and then we're going to do your, your case. Got it. Rewind. What do you think of the two new, <laughs> but I'll tee you back up. What do you, what do you all think of, writ large, the, the impact of these two new justices so far on the court? Yeah. So I would say that we're, we're kind of in an era where it's a one-man show. It's a one-man court. I think that for many parties, in many cases that have um, come before the court this term, it's all about trying to angle for Justice Roberts' vote. And I think that if we turn the clock back a year or two, uh, it was a court where you know, you're jockeying for Justice Kennedy's vote and uh, possibly, possibly trying to see if you can carry some sway with Justice Roberts. But we're very much in an era where it's all about trying to angle for Justice Roberts' vote. Um, I think that Justice Gorsuch has um, proven to be ideologically um, aligned and very much a twin to Justice Thomas. And I think that the uh, record in the cases from this past term definitely bear that out. And I think that um, Justice Kavanaugh has tried to keep us on our toes a little bit and um, you know, has sided with uh, Justice Roberts in a handful of cases uh, that suggests that he may be moderate on particular issues. So I think we're still trying to read the tea leaves with him. But overall, I think that the arrival of these two justices have you know, 
squarely placed uh, Roberts in the center of the court, and uh, it is Justice Roberts that many people are trying to uh, persuade when you're up in the well of the court. I think there's, there's a, uh, uh, obviously a lot of attention paid to the Chief Justice in the center seat and, and to the two new justices, uh, but in some categories of cases, I think that you, uh, you don't see advocates looking primarily at the Chief Justice, I think. So for example, if you are an immigrant petitioning the Supreme Court in a removal case, uh, you may actually be looking to Justice Gorsuch, uh, whose skepticism of government power, I think, has, has already been seen to cut across uh, subject areas, so it's not just in business cases that involve the Chevron doctrine or, or our deference, as we're going to talk about later, uh, but uh, is been enthusiastically taking up the cudgels in uh, criminal and immigration cases as well. And I think that uh, criminal cases and criminal justice more generally may well be an area where you see Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh taking quite different approaches uh, once they uh, uh, really get a, a large number of cases together uh, behind them. And Justice Kavanaugh, I, I think I, I agree with Kristen, has uh, not always been predictable this term. Uh, but one thing that I think is consistent uh, is that he seems to be showing an incrementalist approach. Uh, a lot of his questions are about cases the court has already decided, not about kind of broad sweeping uh, uh, constitutional principles. Uh, and uh, the person that that reminds me of uh, when he was a new justice is the chief justice. Yeah, I think, you know, as we think about the new justices on the court, it's interesting to think about where there might be differences between the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh. And, you know, it's obviously very early. We, you know, have not completed Justice Kavanaugh's first full term on the court. The biggest cases are still outstanding. And we'll you know, be talking about the census and partisan gerrymandering. And I think those will be real tests for the court's new justice. But we already see cases in which we've seen some division between the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh. Um, you know, for example, there was a procedural vote involving a Louisiana abortion law. Um, the Fifth Circuit upheld this abortion restriction that was identical to one that the Supreme Court a couple of years ago had struck down. And it was Chief Justice uh, Roberts who sided with the court's more liberal members to stay that Fifth Circuit decision, whereas Justice Kavanaugh voted with the court's other conservatives. Um, similarly, there was a case involving a Trump administration policy that would have blocked um, immigrants coming over the border illegally from Mexico from seeking asylum. A lower court judge said, no, that's not okay. And it was the Chief Justice, again, who was siding with the court's more liberal members, um, whereas Justice Kavanaugh um, would have blocked that lower court decision and allowed the Trump administration policy to go into effect. So already we're seeing these divisions, and I think it'll be really interesting as we look ahead to see where the Chief Justice and Justice Kavanaugh in the same place and where they're in different places, because I think that will tell us a lot about what Justice Kavanaugh's trajectory is likely to be on the court over the next you know, two decades. I think we're also in an interesting time, maybe the next term or two, where Justice Kavanaugh is still feeling the, the hurt from his confirmation hearings, and so maybe willing to take more moderate positions than he might otherwise have been willing to take. And it would be wise uh, for us to try and capitalize on that. I, I mean, as someone who's always bristled at the idea that for the past few years, we've always been looking to one white man to decide our cases. I mean, nothing about that has changed. But on racial justice issues and voting rights issues, looking to the chief um, scares me a as an option. And so if there's a play to be made for Justice Kavanaugh, even in the short term, I think it would be <coughs> unwise for us to not um, look at that. I, I don't see any other options. But um, having argued last term and this term as well, I think Justice Gorsuch has settled in, is comfortable now opining away. So to the extent there was ever any question about that, it's, it's, it's pretty settled. But Justice Kavanaugh was, was asking all kinds of um, what appeared to be pretty neutral questions this term. I don't, not saying they were neutral, but he's still feeling his way out. And I think he cares about his reputation and wants to put some distance um, between himself and the confirmation hearings, and that might create opportunities for us. On that point, do you find that justices who've had more bruising confirmations who make it on the court, <laughs> Thomas and Kavanaugh being the, the most glaring examples, are impacted in their rulings or only in their positioning? That is to say, questions and wording, but not really where they vote. It was just such a different era between the two. I don't know that you can compare them. I don't think we've ever seen Justice Thomas, you know, 
be a, an ally for for the civil rights bar and the, the voting rights bar. But um, you know, in in an era of Twitter and constant television, and um, I, I don't know. I mean, it may be no different than the last bruising confirmation hearing. But I also think that it's. The, this is the era that we're in, and we have to not rule out any opportunities. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the op-ed that you know Justice Kavanaugh did, um, you know, right at the end of the confirmation process, indicated he wants to be seen as someone who is an independent arbiter and believes in the rule of law. And the question is, you know, what are his decisions on the court going to show about that? You know, something that I think was interesting was hearing him talk about precedent um, in one of the cases this term um, where the court was considering whether to revisit um, an old doctrine about the double jeopardy clause and he talked about how important precedent is, how it itself is a constitutional value. Um, he said, you know, we don't overturn our decisions unless they're egregiously, grievously wrong. And, you know, we haven't gotten a decision in that case yet. It seemed pretty clear where he is there. But what will be interesting to see is you know, how he feels about precedent in other areas where maybe his own personal views differ from where the court has been in the past. Right, and, and an egregiously wrong standard is like a special circumstances standard. It still takes you back to what someone thinks personally is really bad, right? I mean... It certainly can. I some mean, of you his know, other writings yeah, might I mean, suggest you know, on abortion that, that that is for him egregious. Well, so I, I think that's the question. You know, the court has, as Justice Gorsuch talked about at his confirmation hearing, you know, precedent on precedent. You know, it has rules that it's supposed to apply in determining whether to overrule a precedent or not. Because, of course, sometimes it's appropriate and proper for the court to do so. And I think that's something that's going to be interesting coming out of this term, because there's several cases this term that tee up the question of whether to overrule precedent. There was obviously a number of cases last year in which Justice Gorsuch made clear that he feels totally comfortable getting rid of precedents that he disagrees with, you know, regardless of whether he views them as just wrong or egregiously wrong. And so we'll see how Justice Kavanaugh comes out on that. Great. Uh, very interesting hearing from each of you on, on where the court is headed. I want to turn now as Kristen previewed, we call that a tease, she previewed what was going to happen, which is breaking down the census. And this is an area where I, I think there is some well-founded concern or skepticism about our civic dialogue, about uh, the sort of lack of nuance and sort of constant cycles of outrage on the internet and parts of social media. And yet a, a positive that I would port, point to is, uh, I, it certainly seems to me, and, and this sets you up, that uh, the political discourse on the internet also has been digging deeper into how things work and how we got here. Um, so public concern, for example, I think across the spectrum on the role of money in politics or the way that Washington can seem to operate as a kind of a for rent uh, lobbying operation for all sorts of interests. Um, the swamp, as it's sometimes called, has gotten a lot more attention and people online are using the transparency laws and disclosures to to really dig into what's out there and make sense of it. And I think that's actually a, a, a fairly bipartisan concern uh, to some degree. Likewise, when you look at, well, where do these congressional districts come from? Or where do all the federal funding formulas come from? Um, there's rich debate on the internet among regular citizens about this and about whether right now, as Kristen's going to talk about, whether the census is something that is going to continue to work as a neutral, factual framework uh, for federal policy funding and law, or whether, as argued uh, before the court this week, whether there is some effort to manipulate that. Uh, strong arguments, I think, on both sides historically. Um, so walk us through why you have concerns, I think it's fair to say, about a question that was on the census at one point in time, um, but you think could be used uh, to undermine that basic factual framework of, of how the federal government works. Yeah, and you know, uh, just picking up where you leave off, the ruling in this case, I think, is one that um, will impact the country for a decade, and if not, be well beyond that. Uh, because the census, and whether or not we have a fair and accurate um, census this go around, uh, will absolutely impact redistricting and absolutely have an impact on how um, billions of dollars get allocated to communities across the country. So um, there is a lot at stake in this case. So how do we get here? Um, Secretary Wilbur Ross, who heads the Commerce Department, made an 11th hour decision to add a citizenship question to the short form on the census that goes to every household. Um, this is a question that hadn't appeared on the census since Jim Crow. So in six decades, um, the government had not done this. And in large part because, one, 
We get that um, data through another source, through the American Community Survey, uh, through the long form. Um, those are not uh, survey tools that go out to every household, um, but have provided uh, for decades reliable information on the numbers of non-citizens, citizens, and provided a whole um, body of extensive detail uh, for a very long time. The short form on the census, though, is critical. This is how our government lives up to its constitutional obligation under the enumeration clause every decade, to capture a count of the population. It's that simple. And the citizenship question, uh, according to um, studies produced by scientists, uh, according to every body of evidence out there, will depress turnout. It will discourage uh, turnout and, and uh, participation among communities of color. Um, and Wilbur Ross uh, defied uh, you know, science, evidence, and data here uh, by making this 11th hour decision to add the citizenship question to the short form that goes to every household, prompting a wave of uh, concern among, among advocates, uh, prompting uh, inquiries from Congress and prompting lawsuits. So there are six lawsuits that end up getting filed um, across the country about a year ago challenging the administration's move here. Um, the first case was filed by the Attorney General in California. Um, the next case or next set of cases, it was the New York Attorney General filed a case. Um, the, we filed a case at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law because we thought it was important for there to be nonpartisans in this fight. And we filed a suit on behalf of the city of San Jose, which is one of the largest undocumented populations in the country, and on behalf of the Black Alliance for Just Immigration because this, impact, this issue impacts brown and black people. Um, yet another ACLU lawsuit filed on behalf of a, an immigration rights group. Uh, Eric Holder uh, and a team filed a case in Maryland on behalf of impacted individuals, and um, MALDEF filed a case as well. And I wanted to lay all that out because they're, you know, it's kind of an airtight strategy. Everybody's talking about how this impacts them. You've got the states, you've got the cities, you've got individuals, you've got organizations saying we all have a stake in ensuring that there's a fair and accurate census count. Court after court after court, these six cases are before three judges. New York issues a breathtakingly extensive ruling saying this clearly violates the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, then our judge in California said, yep, violates the APA and also violates the enumeration clause of the Constitution. And then Maryland uh, a few weeks ago, same thing. Uh, court issued a ruling finding it violates the APA and the Constitution goes up to the court in a way that I think is almost airtight. But I, I will note one thing. We did not get the opportunity to bring these cases to the appellate level because time's not on our side. The census forms have to be printed by June. So there's a ticking clock here. Uh, so the cases go before the court on Tuesday. And you know it was interesting. Um, you know, how did Wilbur Ross get there? Um, this case, you talked about the swamp RA emerging assume, from that swamp. I assume he got there in a stretch limo, no? Yeah. <laughs> well, out of the swamp comes. Wilbur Ross is rich joke, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> comes, nothing wrong with being rich. <laughs> out of the swamp comes Steve Bannon and, and Chris Kobach, who, who lobbied very hard for the citizenship question. And in the course of our litigation, we extracted um, lots of emails and documents that made clear that their fingerprints were all over this. Um, and so, because we only have about two minutes, yeah. I'm going to press you a little bit. So, let's take, as lawyers say, arguendo, that it was really shady how the question got on there, which I think for folks who follow the case, I actually think that's a fair observation. What is your best constitutional argument, notwithstanding that, that this isn't something that the government can ask in this way? Um, because of the extensive evidence uh, making clear that, you know, there was no good faith reason for Wilbur Ross to do this, um, that it violates the uh, standard under the APA. But, the, but does the APA get you to the idea that it's discriminatory or just that it's, as we would say, not the requisite process? In other words, is asking the question in today's world on these facts discriminatory or otherwise illicit?
Or what do you say to the government's argument that we used to ask this question, we're going to ask it now, it's part of the way they want to do what they call fact-finding. Yeah, it's, it's arbitrary and capricious. And you had Wilbur Ross's own scientists saying, we cannot do this, it will produce an undercount. And we have you know, evidence of Ross going to the Justice Department and saying, hey, why don't you ask me for the citizenship question and say you need it to help enforce the Voting Rights Act, and they pass. Then they go to the Department of Homeland Security, make an ask, no success there. Then they go back to DOJ, but go up to a higher level to Sessions, who says, don't worry about it. We'll do whatever you want. Yes, we need this to enforce the Voting Rights Act. And the final question that I think may be of interest to some people is, so, so you have your arbitrary standard from, from the APA review rules. When you go to law school, you hear a lot about rational basis and how that can basically get you anything. Um, but if you can prove that it's an undercount, that this is not what would be considered a quote unquote rational way to count the information that's so vital to the federal government. Why don't you ever get anywhere on that being irrational? Is that just because courts hate using that lack standard to overrule anything? Well, this is where, it, let's come back to Kavanaugh, Justice Kavanaugh and Gorsuch. I mean, it was very remarkable to see them stretching uh, to go beyond the record in this case, frankly, and saying, well, the United Nations recommends that countries ask about citizenship status, and Spain and Germany ask about citizen citizenship status. I mean, it was really remarkable to see how irrational uh, they were, frankly, in ignoring the extensive evidence in this case, making clear that it was a total charade and a sham. So you're making the point that at a, ba at a basic practical litigation strategy, you're just, that's not going to get you far with this court. No. Yeah. Um, any final thought before I keep it moving? Um, just that the stakes are high. Um, I am hopeful that Justice Roberts' vote is in play. He is somebody who says he cares deeply about the integrity and reputation of the court, and I don't see how he can turn a blind eye to the extensive evidence of lies and deceit that informed Wilbur Ross's decision to, to add the citizenship question here. Very interesting, very high stakes, uh, because part of my job as a reporter is to keep it real. Uh, our next case has, one might argue, much lower stakes. Fair? They're, Fair? Very, they're much taller. <laughs> <laughs> That's a statue joke. Uh, by a show of hands, how many people have heard of the American Legion case? Yeah. Less than half, but some. But this is one of those cases that on the one hand feels like, uh, and I'm just setting you up, you can knock me right back down. It feels like yet another in a long line of arguably obscure religious freedom cases at the Supreme Court that are about small things or at least symbolic things. Uh, but you can tell us why we should care, uh, why this is about more than, say, a statute. Uh, and it may actually not turn out to be about more than the particular facts of the case once the court winds up deciding it. So the, the facts are that there is in a uh, war memorial park in Bladensburg, Maryland, uh, a 32-foot uh, war memorial placed by the American Legion uh, that's in the shape of a Latin cross. And uh, there are uh, a number of other kind of uh, commemorative uh, gardens and memorials yeah, in the area, but the, uh, the, the cross is, uh, as I say, 32 feet high, uh, very noticeable, uh, and on public land, which is the, the key point. So the American Humanist Association brought suit under the Establishment Clause uh, asking that the cross be uh, taken down or, uh, or else reconfigured. Uh, and the government defended on the ground that it, it, this is a war memorial. Uh, and it doesn't endorse religion. It doesn't coerce anybody to uh, practice an established church. Uh, but it was str the Fourth Circuit, the uh, uh, appeals court based in Richmond, covering Maryland, uh, held that the uh, uh, that the memorial was unconstitutional. So that went up to the Supreme Court on two petitions: one by the American Legion, which was a party in the case, and one by the government agency that uh, that owns the land. Uh, and both of them had argument time, and they both argued it in different ways. And so this kind of gets to your question about what, what is this going to be? I mean, there are earlier Establishment Clause cases that, uh, that produced what have been uh, mockingly called the three plastic animals rule, you know, the idea that at Christmas time, you know, a, a crash is, is not okay, but if it's surrounded by three 
uh, three plastic animals or a, a, a plastic Santa Claus, maybe that's different. So will the facts of this case produce something very case specific or will it produce something that's very doctrinally important? And uh, for folks, why does the Supreme Court keep taking these kind of cases? Well, it actually, it's been a while since they've had kind of a uh, l large passive religious display case. You know, they, they haven't had a crash in a long time. Uh, what, what, they've, what they've been... Uh, but listen to yourself, man. <laughs> Why, but, but why? Why take this case? Why take this case? I mean, I, or I think they were struck by two things. One, uh, the uh, potential breadth of the Fourth Circuit's reasoning. You know, could this mean that you can't display cross-shaped war memorials at Gettysburg, uh, at the, uh, in Arlington Cemetery, uh, and, and so on? That this could potentially be uh, an appeals court decision that, if applied more broadly, uh, could have a really sweeping impact. Now, the, the plaintiffs the, in this case dispute that. Right? And, and does, do you think the jurisprudence here has a way of distinguishing what might be called proselytizing or overt religious items, like a Ten Commandments on a court front steps to most people, non-lawyers, feels different than someone saying, we're honoring the dead, and the way we honor the dead is religious because we're religious, whatever the religion may be. Well, the, whatever the religion may be, uh, that's kind of what the fact-specific argument in this well, case I'm is about. Well, I'm saying that as a right? huge Jew. Right. Me too, right. <laughs> but, uh, so that, that's, one of the, uh, uh, that's one of the arguments, that there is no tradition of honoring the dead irrespective of their religion by displaying a cross-shaped war memorial. And you know, Justice Breyer asked the question. That it's all, so that it, it, in its essence, becomes not just religious, but an affirmation or a potential government endorsement of a single religion? Right, so right. that's the question in this case. Is this a war memorial or is this a cross? You know, which is the right way to see it? Uh, is, is it a cross-shaped war memorial or is it a cross no matter how, how it's being used? Justice Breyer asked the question whether they could say, look, once upon a time there was a tradition of honoring the war dead uh, with cross-shaped war memorials. Can we say that those can say but don't stay, but don't do it anymore? You know, uh, uh, so. Uh, it seemed like there, there was at least some interest in an, a solution that would n not cut the arms off this cross, you know, not, or, or require that the war memorial be, be taken down. And how does Arlington play in that, where it's mostly crosses, but you have some other insignia? You do, and that's the, that's the plaintiff's response in this case, that you, there, is a wide there are a wide variety of uh, religious symbols that individual soldiers and their families can select for a headstone. Uh, but, there, but, but there are still some cross-shaped war memorials out there. And, and I think that one thing was clear from the, uh, from the oral argument, that the court does not have an appetite to decree uh, that anywhere you see a cross on public land, it is proselytizing, it is endorsing religion, and it must be taken down. It's going to be contextual in some way. Uh, and the fight in this case seems to be about whether, uh, especially in the context of uh, something as long ago as World War I, uh, it's, it, was, it was permissible and it remains permissible to display uh, a cross-shaped memorial. If, you know, the, the, if they decide to go bigger, I mean, this is, this is getting nerdily doctrinal you know, about, uh, about how the Establishment Clause works. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. <laughs> uh, uh, so for those who haven't you know, turned, uh, turned us off at this point. I never point, like to mess with the audience. Just kidding, I do, but look around. There, there's a fight in this case about whether a, uh, a display like this, does it injure anyone? Does it coerce anyone? Or is it enough that it stands there on public land as an endorsement? And the fight about which test to use, that's significant beyond you know, whether there's going to be a 32-foot cross at a traffic circle in Bladensburg. That can affect lots of other things ranging from you know, prayer to uh, you know, uh, other kinds of uh, religious speech and religious memorials in, uh, in public life. So the, uh, the owner of the parkland basically said, we want you to decide nothing other than this memorial is okay. The American Legion is pushing for something broader because as a lot of justices have recognized, including memorably Justice Scalia, the doctrine in this case is a mess. The uh, Supreme Court had a test that they propounded a number of years ago called the so-called Lemon Test, uh, 
uh, which has three parts, uh, and then the court proceeds not to apply when it is inconvenient. So Justice Scalia liked, uh, liked to say that it was like a late night ghoul in a horror movie. Every now and then it would emerge from the grave uh, to, uh, to scare children once again. Uh, and the court seemed to have no appetite to apply the lemon test in this case, but will it have the appetite that at least one member of the court expressed to just inter it? And that's interesting if they want to go in that direction. And the, look, the, I think the limits here relate to what I'm calling the slightly lower stakes because this is not an area where there's a lot of well-funded groups on both sides testing this stuff out with major economic or social consequences, although people care deeply about the outcomes. And so you end up with these pseudo tests that then get relaxed when there's something that comes along and not unlike the famous pornography references, the court says, oh, but I, we, don't want, we don't want that outcome. We certainly, we don't want to take down every great Southern war memorial. I mean, that doesn't feel like what this court, this court at least, uh, wants to do. Well, I, I agree that that doesn't feel like what this court wants to do, especially things that have been standing for a long time. Right, and, so, and, and, the, and the age of it, it's almost, it almost is the opposite of civil rights. If, if you have a pre-Jim Crow precedent to say, and we connects with the census, well, we used to do this in the 40s. The counterargument is often, yeah, and that's the effing problem, right? You, this is what we're trying to get away from, uh, according to many advocates. In the religious and war context, the notion that this is how we've always celebrated our dead or m memorialized uh, the fallen, uh, and that in the old days it was religious, seems to run in the other direction and help them. No. Well, uh, yeah, I think there's, I think there's, I think yes, I think that's right. If I if I understood you right, I and mean, you know, to to analogize to some of the court's other cases, I mean, the the court uh, has I think made a, made a lot out of the fact that there are some practices that were practiced by the same Congress that passed the Establishment Clause, you know, that, mm -hmm. that adopted the Bill of Rights. Uh, you know, take, for example, the practice of legislative prayer. Uh, you know, the same Congress that adopted the Establishment Clause also hired a chaplain. Uh, and the court uh, has said uh, several times, something that was done by the first Congress, sorry, a test that would outlaw something that was done by the first Congress uh, is probably the wrong test. Uh, but that's that's still a very controversial view on the court. You know, uh, mm. legislative prayer split the court uh, pretty uh, uh, pretty deeply uh, within the last decade. Right, and because we're still we're still talking about God, which yes. is which is not something that's easy to resolve in a dry courtroom. Uh, and I'm sure you're familiar with uh, you know the the rapper Rick Ross from Miami. Uh, he's not on the court, right? No, he's not <laughs> not now. Depends who wins the next election, but uh, you know. He talks about the difference between him and, and God. Do you know this? Afraid I don't. You don't know this. So he knows 17 Supreme Court cases, but there are some. That's not in the record. There's some, <laughs> there's some record he doesn't have. Rick Ross says, God forgives and I don't. And I think the, the real question here is how forgiving the court wants to be to a lot of references to God that obviously were stitched within American life at the time. I mean, if you start taking down, again, I'm just being practical here. You're, you're more careful. but. You start taking down a bunch of war memorials, get out of town. Uh, I mean, I just don't, I think it would be a, a political, it would be quite a, a, a political crisis. That's, so that's definitely the... They have to avoid that to some degree. Right, and I think that that's what the American Legion counted on in pressing for something broader. In other words, we are probably going to win this case uh, now that the court has granted cert. So what mileage can we make out of it? What do we get out of Whereas, it? Whereas, you know, Neil Cachell's uh, argument for the park, uh, the MNC PPC, the part, the uh, the government body that owns it, uh, was much more much narrower. Right. Uh, partisan gerrymandering. Yeah. Or so, sorry, is that no Kaiser? Yeah, We're doing Kaiser, Kaiser first. My, sure. my bad. Fine. No, no, that's not, that's my mistake. Uh, Kaiser first. Sorry. Yeah. So Kaiser v. Wilkie is this case that probably folks haven't heard about. I can do another show of hands. Who's heard of Kaiser v. Wilkie? A little bit. Okay. We've got a good we've got a good informed crowd. This case has made fewer headlines than. A lot of the other cases that we're talking about this morning, I don't think the president has tweeted about it, unlike some of the other cases we're talking about this morning, um, but it's actually incredibly important. So the, the narrow question of the case is whether this uh, man, James Kaiser, the Kaiser and Kaiser v. Wilkie, is entitled to benefits from the Department of Veterans Affairs for post-traumatic stress disorder that he's been suffering from since the early 1980s. But the legal question, the reason why this case could have really broad implications beyond Mr. Kaiser or beyond the Department of Veterans Affairs, is whether courts should defer to agencies 
interpretations of their own regulations. And that means what the court decides in this case could have ramifications for every federal agency, whether it does work on consumer protection or workplace safety or the environment. This case, this question about whether courts should defer to agency interpretation of their own regulations um, is a doctrine that goes back decades and decades. The Supreme Court case first called Seminole Rock, then one called Auer, that said, yes, courts should generally defer to agencies' interpretations of their own regulations. That's what is often called Auer deference. Um, the Chief Justice has said that this doctrine goes to the heart of administrative law. So it's, it's clearly an important case in its own right, but I think it's actually particularly important because it might be a harbinger of things to come. What we've seen over the last several years is a broader conservative attack on the modern administrative state, on the way the federal government um, works. And this attack on our deference is just a piece of that. So we've also seen um, attacks on another form of judicial deference called Chevron deference, um, which refers to the fact that courts will defer to an agency's reasonable interpretation of an ambiguous statute. And Chevron deference, I think it's fair to say, is fundamental to the way the government um, operates, the way it protects consumers, the way it protects workers, the way it protects the environment. And there's no secret that this case um, could be just a step along the path to taking on Chevron deference as well. In fact, the petition that was filed in this case, the brief asking the court to hear it, noted that this case would be an appropriate place to start considering broader doctrines of judicial deference to agencies. Uh, we've also seen conservatives attacking independent agencies, so agencies like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, agencies that Congress concluded when they were setting them up um, should have a little bit of independence from the president in order to be able to do their jobs effectively. And this is, a, I think, a particularly important case and a particularly important issue to be thinking about at this moment in time in light of the changes in the composition of the court that we were talking about earlier. Because both Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh, when they were on the lower court, really made little secret of their disdain for the administrative state. Justice Gorsuch, when he was nominated, was celebrated by the business community for his willingness to overturn Chevron. Um, Justice Kavanaugh, when he was on the DC Circuit, wrote an opinion holding that the leadership structure of the CFPB um, was unconstitutional. That decision was subsequently reversed by the full DC Circuit, but it obviously makes clear where Justice Kavanaugh stands on these kinds of issues. And so one of the things that was really interesting about this case when you look at the briefing is you had more than one brief that wasn't actually filed on the issue in the case. It said, you know, this question of whether the court should overrule our deference or not, we don't have a view on that. But what we do feel really strongly about is court, whatever you do here, you shouldn't do anything to call into question Chevron deference. So even in the briefs that were filed in this case, you had people looking ahead and looking down the line to what the, the larger implications could be. And you know, so this is one of the ones that hasn't been decided yet, and I think it wasn't clear from argument what's going to happen, whether the court is actually going to go fully and overrule the doctrine entirely. Um, interestingly, the Solicitor General of the United States filed a brief in this case and said, you know, there's lots of problems with this doctrine, you should impose some limitations, um, but you don't need to get rid of it entirely. And so I, I think what I'm going to be looking for when we get a decision in this case is, you know, what does the court do? One, what are its implications for these kind of other administrative law doctrines, where the court might be heading on this broader set of issues? Um, but also going back to something we talked about a little bit earlier, is how the court is handling precedent. Um, because I think, you know, in this case, you have teed up a question of whether the court is going to overrule um, a doctrine that has been around for decades and decades. You know, it was interesting at argument, Justice Kagan, uh, you know, brought up that normally when the court is considering its prior precedents, particularly in a context where Congress could step in if it disagreed, the court doesn't touch those unless there's a really, really, really good reason to. But there was an interesting tell because she basically was like, you know, this is something we take very seriously and we need a, and then she stops herself and said, well, at least we used to need a good reason to do that. And so I think it'll be interesting to see what the court does here, but also how it does it. Uh, when we study the long-term shifts in, in these areas, uh, there's a lot of interest in, you know, what's the wider climate on certain issues? We were just obviously speaking about that in religion, certainly in civil rights and choice. Uh, I, I don't think you have to be a legal realist to know that the wider climate and political culture has some impact. It certainly affects how the judges are careful in what they say and how they're scrutinized in their confirmation hearings, et cetera. And then you have these other areas of the law um, that have almost no public undertow because they are either too uh, 
obscure or uninteresting to even be in the political stakes uh, or are otherwise um, just simply not at that level. Um, do you think, based on your, your, your deep knowledge of this issue, that the shift from Chevron and administrative law and the administrative state from things that I think were truly uh, lawyers only or lawyers and people who care about the court only to being presidential campaign level issues. I mean, the notion that Chevron deference was coming up at debates, uh, that, that someone like Steve Bannon, who, like Donald Trump, may not have seen as, uh, for most of his public career, has been likely to make big decisions in the White House, um, was campaign chair and then senior White House advisor and was talking about taking apart the administrative state. Um, does that just make these cases a little more colorful and interesting, or do you believe at a, at a jurisprudential level it actually could have some, some impact? Well, I mean, I think it's testament to how important the issue is, even if it's one that normally doesn't get the general public super excited in the way that certain other issues do. The impact on people's lives could be hugely significant. And conversely, you know, the business community cares a lot about these things and has been part of a concerted effort to get rid of these doctrines because they want less regulation. But you're, they don't you're and I say this respectfully, but you're saying facts, but you're not necessarily answering the question. <laughs> Uh, and I think sometimes lawyers are hesitant to speculate on what, how the court actually reaches its decisions, although I think that's what we're all really interested in. I, I guess what I'm asking yeah. is, does the fact that there is probably more public support, or at least visible support, uh, in, in the mainstream conservative movement to go against these precedents, does that make it more likely that the court would take action in your view or not? Well, I think one thing that makes it more likely the court will take action is that you've seen this bubbling up in the lower courts as well. And this is something that both Justice Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh were a part of when they were on the lower courts, where you see opinions is in this by- Gorsuch, This is Gorsuch's obsession when he was in the lower court. I mean, yeah, and he wrote separate opinions. You know, despite his profound love of precedent that we heard about when he was at his confirmation hearing, he wrote opinions when he was a lower court judge saying the Supreme Court should reconsider its precedent in this so area. Is it, and this, I'll stop pressing you. Is it easier- to go against the precedent or do something that might be seen within the bar as, well, wait a minute, you're turning over a lot, when there is now an identified uh, extra legal or external constituency for it. What I'm asking is if 10 years ago it would have looked more radical, today you could make the argument that even a far-reaching breach or shift uh, to, to, to Chevron or any of these doctrines would actually have a good portion of the country being you know, saying, oh, great, yeah, I heard, I heard the administrative state was too big. I heard Bannon told me this is actually the thing holding back uh, my guy. Yeah, I mean, I think you see this across different areas where things that seem off the wall, you know, at one point gradually become on the wall. They become things that seem within the realm of the possible. And when you have this foundation laid, um, it becomes easier for the court to do things. And it's an important reminder, you know, obviously we're focusing here on the Supreme Court, but the other way that Trump is having, you know, an incredibly enduring legacy is by putting lots and lots of really conservative individuals in the lower courts. And because you have those lower court judges, it obviously has a tremendous impact in terms of the actual cases they're deciding, but also the ways they can try to shift the law that then makes it easier to have shifts at the Supreme Court as well. Yeah, and, they've, and, the, and the administration, while leaving vacancies in many other areas, has been, as you say, super aggressive about that. You almost start to wonder whether Donald Trump is impersonating uh, a less informed person as a character and actually knows exactly what he's doing and what the base cares about. Gerrymandering. Partisan gerrymandering. Uh, the court heard two cases last term when um, uh, when there was a different court and there was a belief that Justice Kennedy was the key to, to setting some boundaries, some limits on partisan gerrymandering. Um, it heard the cases at two different times and there were procedural problems with both cases. And so the court ended up punting on, on those procedural grounds in both cases. Um, during one of the oral arguments, Justice Breyer was like, well, there's so many different theories of liability and facts, and we need to just get them all together and hear all the options um, at once. And that's what happened this term. The, the court took the North Carolina case, which was um, just running behind the Wisconsin and Maryland case, and then later took the Maryland case as well because it had proceeded past some of its procedural hurdles and set up a, a day of argument where it uh, confronted both a Republican gerrymander and a Democratic gerrymander. So this wasn't a, a the court, you know, slapping the wrist of um, irksome Republicans in North Carolina, but really trying to grapple with the larger issue. 
Um, Paul Clement argued for, for North Carolina and put all, put all of his chips on one bet, which is that this court, without Justice Kennedy, would rule that partisan gerrymandering cases are non-justiciable, meaning the court just needs to stay out of it, can't take the cases, can't rule on it. Um, and I don't think the court was, per, even the conservative justices were particularly compelled by that. Um, he didn't get a lot of positive reaction. He got some skepticism from um, uh, the chief on that front. But that's the game. I mean, everyone thought after Justice Kennedy uh, retired and he was the, going back to the Pennsylvania case, was the, the swing vote on the court can rule on partisan gerrymandering cases if it can figure out what the standard is. Um, that, that it was over. I don't think the chief necessarily, um, he, he made no comments on justiciability in the last partisan gerrymandering case that was out of Texas in 2006. It was the only other partisan gerrymandering case he'd heard. Um, he obviously got rid of Wisconsin and, and Maryland on standing grounds rather than non-justiciability grounds. And the, the question is now, Justice Breyer got his dream. We gave him a menu of different ways in which a par, uh, the court can grapple with when does a partisan gerrymander cross the line. Um, First Amendment theories, n uh, numerous doctrinal approaches under the First Amendment, under the Equal Protection Clause. And the, the, what the court fears, and I think what the chief fears, is that these redistricting cases that come up on three-judge panel review, mandatory review, he doesn't want a lot of those. He doesn't want to be flooded with second-guessing every partisan decision. And they don't want to try and take partisan considerations and political considerations out of the redistricting process. But they know that... Um, you know, if there's not some line, we're going to keep seeing what we're, we've seen in the last 20 decades, the last 20 years. It's just getting worse and worse and worse. The technology makes it easier. Um, the legislators are unabashed in their intent. I mean, they're saying, I want to stick it to the other party, and I'm going to draw districts that make sure they can never win. Um, and I think there's a recognition by even many of the conservatives that this is... Um, toxic to democracy, when, when there is no way that voters can self-correct, um, no matter how, how, how high turnout is, no matter how um, strong the sentiment is for the line drawing party, if there's nothing that voters can do in districts that are so carefully crafted to stay performing for one political party over the course of a decade, um, then some uh, action is needed. Otherwise, um, you're going to see more of this rhetoric. You're going to see more of this manipulation. And, and Justice Kavanaugh sort of, bemo in his confirmation hearings and afterwards, was, was bemoaning the partisan rhetoric directed at him, understandably. But this is, this is now going to be baked in even more to redistricting. And if the court says, this is non-justiciable, or what North Carolina did was OK, that's going to be read as a green light for that kind of language and manipulation to to propagate, and it, no one will trust that the districts being drawn for them are in any way districts in which they'll have a say. If they're preordained outcomes, why bother, going to, why bother going to vote? How do you interpret the court's stated hesitance to really get into this? I mean, it's, it is considered and has been termed the political thicket for a long time. I think they're... That's sort of, um, they feel like they have to say that. It's sort of part of their history. The truth is, in cases where they have waded into the political th thicket of what is normally an activity performed by the legislative branch, it hasn't opened the floodgates, right? I mean, they, they, they were told, if you get into the mal malapportion cases, the one person, one vote, where districts are unequally sized, you'll never see the end of it. Not true. They were told if you get into the, the racial justice redistricting cases, you'll never see the end of it. Um, again, not true. It, it underestimates how hard the burden of proof is on litigants challenging unfair redistricting cases. I think they have to say it, but I also think, and, and they're used to saying it, but to, to totally cut this off as an avenue 
um, for relief for people whose, whose voices are being silenced, who are suffering First Amendment and 14th Amendment injuries, is going to encourage more of it. And it's going to create a weird patchwork where maybe in some states, under state constitutions, um, some people have some relief. There were a couple of justices looking at that for an, as an out. Well, why can't the states just take care of it? Well, there's nothing that voters in North Carolina can do on their own to change their constitution or to create new protections um, or safeguards against partisan gerrymandering. Uh, voters in California can. Voters in Florida can. But I don't think that the idea of a patchwork quilt of justice appeals to even, even the conservatives. Why haven't they just come up with a more numerical test for what is unacceptable in rigging districts? In other words, they make up, they, they don't admit it, but they make up tests all the time with words, right? Here's your four-part test, and we're balancing, and this to that, right? And you're like, what is this? Okay, you're balancing. Isn't that what you do by definition when you have two parties fighting? Why don't you have some exploration of a test where you say, yeah, it's very hard. If it's, if it's 1% difference, if that's what the gerrymander shifted, well, you, maybe that doesn't feel big. But if, as we've seen and as, as you mentioned, you know, litigants have proven areas where the majority, you know, the majorities went one way, say 55 percent and the and the swing is a 15 percent swing and the other party controls 60 percent and you say well I don't care if it's purple or orange whatever that shift is seems too large well, why why don't they try that so there's been these numbers have existed for a while and there's two primary reasons the court's not been satisfied by the metrics proposed by litigants to date one is that um, a belief that these metrics or ways of measuring the, the ex extremity of the partisan gerrymandering are really just getting to proportional representation. And we don't have proportional representation and we're not, that's not our system of, our, our political system and we don't want that. So you have to find some way to measure the, the extremity of the partisan gerrymander that isn't just proportional representation cloaked in another name. And the second is this concern that litigants, you know, in in Bandemer in 86 and Veith in 2004 came in and said, oh my God, the sky is falling. The other, the party out of power will never, ever, ever be able to win an election. And then in the next election, <laughs> they were proven wrong. The social science has gotten a lot more sophisticated over the last few years on sensitivity testing and determining exactly what kind of swing, political swing, would be necessary to flip one district, to flip two districts. And it's actually been borne out. I mean, we've, we've predicted it in these gerrymandered districts, and they've held true. Um, and so I think, you know, the af especially after Veith, the, the social science and the social science and, and the academic world said, okay, the court says it needs a metric that's not just about proportional representation. So a lot of, of the social scientists looked to the vote dilution cases where there's lo been lots of ways of explaining and measuring vote dilution and said, well, this isn't about proportional representation. This is about equal opportunity to elect the candidate you prefer. And so we've moved that way, and that was one of the things we offered to the court. Look, this is, this is a vote dilution framework. It's not, it's not proportional representation. These are metrics and numbers you've used in Section 2 cases for decades. You know how to do this. And we have sensitivity testing now. We can tell you, um, it, if they had had this sensitivity testing in Veith in 2004, they would have said, this, this gerrymander is not going to hold. It's a, it's a quote unquote dummy gerrymander. It looks like it's a gerrymander, but it's really, um, these districts are way too competitive. They're going to flip um, with just an ounce of change in political will. The, the people drawing the lines now are a lot more strategic and smart and have better data. And so they don't draw ger dummy manders. They don't draw, um, you know, in North Carolina, we've got 13 congressional districts. They might try and draw another Republican district, but then they'd have to make the margin so small that they could flip. Instead, they say, I know I can draw 10 solid Republican districts that will not move the, during the entire decade, and that's what I'm going to draw. If I could draw 11 that would hold the, dec the entire decade, I would. But since I can't, I'm going to draw the 10. Makes sense. Uh, 
What I'd like to do here is, is get in some questions. We can still go back and forth with the panel a little bit, but I want to make sure with all the folks here. Uh, what I'll do is take two at a time. It could be a question or a comment. I would ask you keep it under a minute. You can identify yourself if you choose or not. Uh, and after taking two, we'll, we'll throw it to the panel and then come back out. And we do have a microphone, so I think there's someone ready right here if you want to walk into the second row. Hi, it's Ariane with CNN. I had two questions, uh, one for Allison. If there is, if they say it's ju ju justiciable and they find something super, super narrow, what would that look like? And is that a win for your side? Um, and then I had a question for Kristen on the census. How did the president's tweet the other day undermine his solicitor general's argument before the court. Those are mine. And is there another? Sir. Yeah, I'm Bob Barnes with the Washington Post, which explains my Zen state. <laughs> um, the, I, I'm, I would like the panel to address um, Elizabeth's uh, opening remarks, if you would, about uh, whether, about the president's comments about the Supreme Court, and as she put it, that uh, he thinks that he has the president, uh, I mean, he has the court in its back pocket. And what that means for the court and, uh, and what you think the court can do about it. So uh, I think there's two ways we can win the partisan gerrymandering case on narrow grounds. And I think both are wins. One is a little bit um, more widespread, but I think any win has a deterrent effect. So marking that in the W column. Um, the court could embrace the test that my clients proposed, which is a very, very narrow test, which asks the court to only police the worst of the worst. So there's going to be a lot of partisan gerrymandering in the middle. Um, and the, the court would only be involved with these very extreme statistical outliers. Um, so we're talking about a small number of redistricting plans this decade. Um, that's a very narrow win. You could also have a very narrow fact-based win. So almost viewing what North Carolina did, not as a partisan gerrymander, but as a piece of legislation that was enacted with animus towards a politically unpopular group. So uh, a rational basis with bite review almost. Like these facts are so egregious. The North Carolina Republicans bragged so unabashedly about what they were doing and how they were trying to rig the elections, that that can't stand. But the court doesn't yet say, well, here's a standard that we can use to measure partisan gerrymandering in the future. Um, I do think the court is likely to go a narrow route. I, there are some doctrinally sound First Amendment grounds for striking this down, but I think it's going to be very hard then for them to avoid getting lots and lots of partisan gerrymandering cases where there's been um, uh, you know, a, a burden on speech on voting. Um, so I expect if we win, it will be narrow. Uh, it'll have a deterrent effect. It'll fix North Carolina, and it might, as we approach the next redistricting cycle, let the folks drawing lines know that there's some line that you can't cross. And I think what we've seen in the past then is, in, in a lot of cases, backing away from that line. So it's a good positive effect. And uh, which tweet? <laughs> <laughs> There's so many. So the one I think from yesterday, was it, where he said, um, um, we have to, what was it? I don't, I don't have we it. We need to know who's in the country. Yeah. 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 So, um, you know, with this court, they seem very inclined to put on blinders when it comes to really parsing the president's words and understanding the motives driving a lot of the policy actions that he's undertaken during his, during his presidency. Um, I do think that that explanation is at odds with what we heard from the Solicitor General in court on Tuesday, which was that Wilbur Ross has a lot of discretion. And uh, you know, we sh you know, he has career people working for him who want all kinds of things. And uh, you know, his scientists may have said X, but at the end of the day, he has broad, wide discretion to um, have you know put the citizenship question on there if that was what was in his best judgment. But the only way that that flies is if you put on the blinders to 
all of the evidence that showed that um, there was something else happening here. And if you ignore things like what the president um, and people around him have said all along. I mean, this is an administration that wants to render people of color and immigrants and people of the Muslim faith invisible. They want to lock them out. And you know, we've seen dangerous policy actions from this administration at every turn that makes that clear. And I think that the, uh, the only way that the court um, can arrive at a lot of the um, decisions that it's taken on the Muslim ban and other cases is by ignoring the, the, the kind of um, smoking gun evidence of what's really driving so much of what's at play. Is that something that's really different about the court now? Or, or is that just in starker relief because of what is widely understood to be an unusual president? whether people view that as unusual good or unusual bad or unusual mixed. Uh, because, you know, the, the, one of the biggest cases that Obama won was upholding Obamacare. And he had said, this is definitely not a tax. And it was upheld on the taxing power. And he said it in his style of speech, which is known to be different than Donald Trump's. But jurisprudentially, what's the difference? Well, I think what's different now is that we're in an era where we're seeing an unusually high level of, you know, naked animus and discriminatory motive driving a lot of what we're seeing from this administration. Whether you're talking about, so is the, I, I think that's yeah. true because I think there is well-known statements of, of support for, for example, bigotry by the sitting president, which is no small matter to your point. But then, are you for a for a discussion like this, are you advocating a cutout that the, that the words of the sitting president should matter jurisprudentially more in specifically that field as opposed to tax cases? No, I think it should always matter. Uh, that we want to always seek, search for the truth. That's what we expect from our courts. And so when we see this court putting on blinders in selective fashion, it's deeply troubling. I think about the Masterpiece case, for example. But then, so then in this example, and then I'll let you continue yeah. then, though, just to be clear, then do you say, well, the court should have taken into evidence that the president said Obamacare was not a tax and thus not upheld it on the taxing power? Perhaps. Perhaps. But um, discriminatory motive, I think, um, you know, it's troubling because it gets to, you know, what's at the heart of the 14th Amendment. And um, the, the, the ways in which this administration has set its sights on discriminating against people of color is deeply troubling. I think about the masterpiece case, though, where Scalia didn't do that. And, you know, all of a sudden he said, well, I, I want to really understand the motives of these commissioners. I looked at the statements they made, which suggest that they uh, thought and spoke about uh, you know, this, the, the, the cake shop owner's religion in a disparaging way. Um, it's inconsistent and it's troubling. Because, and for the rest of the panel, it, it doesn't seem to be an area where the court uh, either wants to experiment or has, has perhaps grown. Uh, but, you know, is there going to be any searching inquiry, particularly in cases we've talked about, you talked about the travel ban and census. These are both areas where what's at issue is, is something that's uncomfortable for the courts, which is do you, do you believe the government at all? Do you begin with a posture that the government's word through the Solicitor General or through the administration is effectively meaningless because of what's out in the open? To Kristen's point, the other side of the tax argument would be, well, look, how, how much, and what Elizabeth was saying in her introduction, how much are we really going to countenance before we acknowledge that it doesn't look like this is your purpose for the census, and it doesn't look like you picked five states, five countries at random. Um, but, but with your views. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are different types of cases, right? And motive is relevant to some types of legal questions and not relevant to others. You know, you're talking about uh, the Affordable Care Act, you know, whether the individual mandate was a constitutional exercise of Congress's commerce power or its taxing power. That's a legal question, and you know, President Obama's legal analysis, President Trump's legal analysis, none of that's really relevant. What matters is you know, what the Supreme Court concludes about what is a tax, um, what is a proper exercise of Congress's commerce authority. So your, your, lim your limiting pr principle there is, well, if, if the candidate says it's not a tax and the Congress comes along and passes legislation that issues a tax, it's easier to leave out the, the candidate's statement as opposed to the candidate says we're going to discriminate against, say, I don't know, Muslims. Uh, 
that carries over more? Yeah, well, I mean, there's objective criteria that exist in court precedent about whether something is a tax or not. When you're talking about the Muslim travel ban, you know, the question there was, was there animus that was behind the ban? And we know that there was because the president's statements made it clear repeatedly. You know, with the census, too, the objective test the court needs to apply in terms of the kind of statutory question in the case, in terms of the APA questions, is whether the reason that the Secretary of Commerce gave for adding this question um, is the real one, because whenever you're reviewing any kind of administrative action, you have to look at the reason the agency gave. And so when the agency is giving a reason that is contradicted by all of the evidence in the administrative record and by the statements the president's making, it makes clear how protectual that reason is, and that makes it arbitrary and capricious. So I think there's just different cases. Some of them, sometimes uh, president's statements are gonna be highly relevant, and other times that they won't be. I think you see in the wave of litigation that challenges basically everything the administration does. You see a concerted effort to rely on motivation for this sort of strategic reason. A lot of the states and advocacy groups that are bringing these cases very much want the next president to have all of the power uh, that the statutes confer, but they don't want President Trump to be uh, able to rely on that broad grant of authority. So that's why you see increasing reliance on the arguments that, well, yes, the president has broad authority over you know, immigration and naturalization, but this action by this president is motivated by discriminatory animus. So it is unconstitutional what the next president, who is purer of motive, may have just as broad authority to undo or, you know, or uh, put in place different, uh, different rules. You uh, expect the next president to be purer than this president? Uh, I think that's a strategic bet that, that, uh, that, these, that these litigants are making, right? Yeah, but, uh, but not, I'm but, just messing with you. I, I want to- Boggs question comes in yes. too, right? Like well, that's the, why I advanced along. The, so the, the president is tweeting, the Roberts Court's gonna give me a free pass. They're, they're, they're gonna give me what I want over and over again. And you know, at some point, yes, I agree with you totally. The, the, there's the legal doctrine, there's the, the facts, there's the burdens of proof on the various parties, and that should be controlling. But it's a tipping point. At some point, Roberts the institutionalist has to say, notwithstanding the vast number of cases filed against the administration, whether it's you know because they don't like him or he's just really overstepping left and right, at some point there's a tipping point where chief just the chief, as an institutionalist, says, when the president is saying, my court, my independent body that is just calling balls and strikes, is going to call a um, a fair a fair pitch every single time. No one's going to believe my my branch of government is actually independent. I don't know where that tipping point is, but I, I have to think that every time the president tweets something like that, Chief Justice Roberts is like going crazy. Yeah, I mean. It's just prompted the Chief Justice to make that very unusual statement, right, public statements, and there's no such thing as Obama judges or Trump judges or Bush judges. We're just all judges trying to do our level best to give equal justice to, to everybody. Um, you know, I think um, the, the Chief Justice stepping out in that way, I think these bold statements, bold and brazen statements repeatedly from the <coughs> president where he kind of claims it's his court, I think his selection of not just Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, but um, really the lion's share of nominees that he's put forward who seem to have been picked with a uh, kind of razor level precision in terms of where they fall on issues like Roe v. Wade and the Second Amendment and all of these issues that are like, uh, you know, uh, uh, go to the heart of his agenda, leaves us with this very uncomfortable feeling that the courts are becoming an institution that is just about carrying out his agenda. And then you throw on top of that this um, increasing practice that we're seeing from this administration of you know, taking cases that are filed and just trying to leapfrog over the appellate courts to go right to his new friends on the Supreme Court. It just, it is all very, very uncomfortable. And I think that we um, have to be concerned about the integrity of our courts. And I'll just add, I mean, this is a particularly important question, I think, looking ahead to next term. You know, obviously, the census case this term is a huge test for this court and whether they are going to be independent checks on this administration. But next term, there can be multiple cases that are really about this administration's and its policy. So, you know, there are cert petitions pending with respect to DACA, um, the immigration policy. There are cert petition petitions um, potentially coming on the transgender military ban. Right. You can imagine cases about congressional subpoena enforcement fights making their way up to the court in some posture next year. 
the national emergency declaration cases could move quickly and be up at the court next year. So next term, I mean, is already there's a number of really important cases on the docket, and you could see a number of really important ones that are specifically about this administration and its actions. Well, and you mentioned Chief Justice Roberts making that very rare statement, disagreeing with the sitting president uh, in a statement to the Associated Press, uh, which is highly unusual. Uh, and I think can be looked at two ways, because on the one hand, uh, he's clearly concerned about a president who has been totally inappropriate in the way that he has impugned the independence of both law enforcement and the courts and attacked judges and attacked judges personally and racially. And all of that, I think, is, is quite objectionable. And yet, if you read, if you read Robert's response, um, on the evidence, he may have the weaker side of that argument. Because Trump sounds like what was once called a legal realist, saying it seems like the political association of these judges and their appointments matters a lot in some of their rulings, particularly on divided issues, which is why we all know we have such big battles over who goes on all the courts. We all know that. Everybody knows that. That's not a secret. Uh, and yet it was Roberts trying to assert that that's not really the issue and political associations don't matter. We don't have, quote unquote, Republican and and Democratic judges. So Trump, in, on that narrower issue in his cynicism, uh, is both supported by a lot of, of the data we have about how courts rule and what matters and who's appointing them, and, and I think the public's understandable concern and sometimes cynicism about this, even though that's the one thing where Trump's critique overlaps with facts and the rest of it, for example, impugning uh, judges based on their race, that their race will determine the outcome of their ruling, um, is, is is both false and reprehensible. So I, I thought it was fascinating, and I thought Roberts, given it's a reminder, you know, John Roberts, like James Comey, very good at certain things, um, but high self-regard might lead them to step into areas of of uh, communications or political strategy that is not their strong suit. By the way, nor should it be, because it's not what they're supposed to specialize in. So Roberts, of all the things he could have leaned into, leaned into. Uh, a legal realism debate with the president that, that I don't think he was actually on the strongest ground on, which is my own uh, observation. Moderator's privileged to add a thought. Uh, in closing, we have about three minutes. I will take two more questions or comments from, from the audience before we go. If there are. Yes, sir. We're going to bring a mic. Thank you. I have a question for Brianne. I, I know you guys briefed in uh, Gamble, and I wonder if you have any predictions for the outcome. And in particular, there is a companion case called Bear Comes Out that is about the dual sovereign exception with regard to Indian tribes as opposed to states and their separate inherent authority. The court's waiting until it makes a decision in Gamble to decide whether to take that. And whether you think the court will you know, if it comes to that, would recognize that distinction and whether your organization also would recognize the, the separate status of a tribal sovereign as opposed to a state sovereign in this regard. For those, well, let's take two. And another one, if anyone's out there. For those keeping track, that's a double jeopardy question, bootstrapping a dual sovereignty question, very high level questioning going on. Uh, final comment or question from anyone in the back before we go? Great. Well, that means people are reasonably satisfied with what you've had to say. What I'll do is starting with Brianne, an answer to that, uh, and then down the line, in a paragraph or less, your final thoughts on what people should take away if they look to this term and next. Um, so on that question, I, I haven't looked at that case. That's really interesting. I'll definitely take a look at it. I imagine it sounds like the court might send it back to the lower courts to look at depending on what it does in Gamble. Um, in terms of where the court is heading in Gamble, obviously, always dangerous to make predictions from argument. You know, there was certainly a lot of discussion about precedent in that particular case. So you know, it seemed like there was some chance the court was leaning toward leaving things as they are on that ground. There was also a lot of discussion about what the implications of getting rid of the dual sovereignty exception would be. You know, obviously, that's not where we think the court should be, because I think there are really compelling reasons um, rooted in the Constitution's text and history that the dual sovereignty exception should be eliminated. But it seems like maybe that's not where the court's going to go. And so it'll be interesting to see how they talk about it, and again, how they talk about precedent in that case as compared to other cases this term and next. I think this term and next are going to be points where we're still uh, sussing out what the effect is of losing Justice Kennedy. 
Justice Kennedy was the, the swing vote for, for so long, but he wasn't solid on a lot of issues. He wasn't great for me on a lot of voting stuff. He was very good um, on reproductive rights and LGBTQ rights. Um, and so figuring out how that's going to shift, I think Justice Kavanaugh is still deciding what he wants his reputation to be and how he's going to lean. But um, you know, as much as you know, losing Justice Kennedy on voting rights issues, you know, I was sort of okay. Um, I think for uh, women who need access to health care and um, LGBTQ folks who are looking to government to protect them, there's two titles. I think two Title VII cases on the LGBTQ um, employment practices going up next term. I, I'm deeply concerned about how this new court without Justice Kennedy will treat those cases. Yeah, I mean, next term is looking to be a huge one. There are those cases Allison just mentioned. There's a Second Amendment case, which will be the court's really first opportunity to talk about how it figures out what reasonable what gun regulations are reasonable um, post Heller. Um, there are lots of other cases that could be working their way to the court next year, including these cases involving the Trump administration, as I mentioned. And so I think it's a really challenging time for the Chief Justice, for other justices who are concerned about the institutional legitimacy of the court, about the reputation of the court, and their own reputations as independent arbiters. And you know, I keep coming back to precedent and how the court treats it, but you know, at this moment in time when there are so many critically important issues that the Supreme Court has decided in recent years on five vo four votes, so issues related to reproductive rights, to civil rights, to access to the courts, environmental rights, how the court treats its own precedent, when it decides to follow it and when it doesn't, I think is gonna be critically important. And if it starts to look like the justices follow precedent, only when that precedent happens to align with their own policy preferences, I think the court's reputation and the reputation of those justices um, is gonna take a real hit. Yeah, and I, just to, to follow up on exactly that last point, I think that one thing to keep an eye on is that the liberal justices do not have the same view as, uh, as each other on stare decisis, just as Justice uh, Gorsuch and the Chief Justice don't have the same view on stare decisis. But if you look at some of the lower stakes cases in which stare decisis has been in play, you know, Justice Ginsburg has a much, much uh, greater uh, willingness to entertain throwing out a precedent with which she disagrees, special justification or no, than say Justice Kagan, who seems to have really doubled down on precedent is really, really important. Uh, and uh, whether, uh, uh, the current 5-4 alignment uh, causes any of them to rethink that, you know, causes Justice Ginsburg to retreat more to a star, uh, pro stare decisis position uh, or not. I think that's one of the most important uh, things to keep an eye on uh, as we wait for these, uh, these issues to trickle up to the court next term. And I think um, the dark cloud looming over this discussion today is that um, this president may get one more appointment before it's all said and done. And I think that's something we have to be gravely concerned about, um, particularly as we see the Senate um, abandoning the longstanding rules and traditions that have guided their approach to handling nominations. Um, and I think that you know the the Supreme Court in the last few decades has been one that has, um, at times, taken bold steps to expand rights, expand civil rights. And I think increasingly we're going to see the courts all the way down to the district courts issuing blows uh, to the civil rights of our nation's most vulnerable communities. I think that will likely awaken the conscience of the public. I think the courts are the one branch of government that the public um, historically hasn't seized on uh, or paid a lot of attention to. Um, but I think sadly we're bracing for an era where we're gonna see the power of the courts in ways that prove very harmful and devastating. And so my hope is that sooner rather than later, uh, we can get the public to pay more attention to what's happening, um, hold the Senate um, accountable for their failure to carry out their role in properly vetting um, nominees. There are a lot of important fights in the pipeline. And I think that you know the last point I'll make, Ari, is that uh, because we've seen President Trump be so successful in appointing hostile judges who bear records that make clear that many of them lack the capacity to be fair and impartial, that they've emboldened lawmakers in ways that we're seeing right now in Georgia. You know, there's an attack on Roe v. Wade in Florida. They have, they're rolling back Amendment 4, and I think they're doing it because they know the courts are increasingly stacked in their favor. Um, so I think Sadly, dark times lie ahead. Well, 
Wasn't it Judge Learned Hand who said, precedent is like a fine oak dining room table. You keep it for as long as possible, but eventually you throw it out. He didn't really say that. <laughs> uh, on that note, uh, please give a special thanks to Elizabeth Woodra, who, who kicked us off and who's led this, and Kristen Clark and William J. Allison Riggs and Brianna Garode. And um, I hope you leave here more informed than when you came. I know I feel like I did listening to our very uh, thoughtful panelists. Give them a hand.